In the last video, we met the Dirac Delta, modeling a unit impulse at the moment t equals a. We worked out that the Laplace transform of this generalized function centered at a is e to the negative s a. In this video, we are just going to do some computation. So we're going to work through two differential equations where the right-hand side looks like a Dirac Delta. So let's go ahead and get started with this first order example. Our first example is y prime plus 6y equals the Dirac delta shifted to t equals 1, so delta of t minus 1. And we are going to put an initial condition that when t equals 0, our position function is at 3 units. We are going to take the Laplace transform to solve this, but before we do that, let's talk over what we should expect the solution to look like, because we can actually anticipate from this expression what we're going to find. Now, when t is less than 1, the right-hand side is basically 0. I mean, it is 0. So between t equals 0 and t equals 1, the right-hand side is 0, which means that our solution should behave like the solution to the differential equation y prime plus 6y equals 0. That's like y prime equals negative 6y. That's exponential decay. So we're thinking about a solution which just experiences exponential decay, and then at one unit of time, we strike it. So at one unit of time, we're going to take this decaying position function, strike it. It's going to react. But once we, we hit it with a hammer, then there's no more force beyond that. So we gave it an impulse, and then we let it go. So then after t equals 1, we're going to go back to exponential decay. So it's like exponential decay, hit it, more exponential decay. That's what our solution should communicate to us. But let's see if we can get to that now with the Laplace transform. Okay, so let's just take the Laplace transform of both sides. On the left-hand side, we have L of y prime plus 6y. And on the right-hand side, we're going to have the Laplace transform of the drop delta centered at 1. We do have an initial condition here that when y is 0, um, sorry, that when t is 0, y is 3. So here on this left-hand side, going to write this as s plus 6 times the Laplace transform of y minus 3. And then on the right-hand side, this is going to be e to the negative s. Maybe I should make a note that here a is 1. So e to the negative a s is e to the negative 1 s. All right, let's isolate that Laplace transform of y. I think we can do it all in one step. So we'll bring 3 over and divide by s plus 6. OK, I'm going to keep these two terms on the right-hand side separate. So bring 3 over, divide by s plus 6, and then we'll have e to the negative s divided by s plus 6. All right, we've solved several of these equations, but I think especially with expressions like this, you have to go kind of slowly. For this first one, this one we can invert pretty much right away. So 3 is just a constant. What is the Laplace transform of 1 over s plus 6? It's going to be e to the negative 6t. OK, so that's for the first one. For the second one, it might be helpful to write this e to the negative s in front and think of this as e to the negative s times 1 over s plus 6. In fact, let me just do that. OK, let me just kind of slide things around. We've seen this kind of construction before, but I think it's always helpful to have a chart with you. Um, so actually, let me give you a moment to look at your notes and figure out how we handle this. So we have an expression here that looks ready to invert, but we've got this exponential in front. What does that do in our inversion process? All right, hopefully what you either remembered without notes or found in your notes is that this kind of leading exponential here causes a time delay when we invert. So this piece looks like e to the negative 6t, I'm not done, but we are going to shift in t. So we translate in t here. 
one is just kind of an unfortunate number because like, you don't have to write it. So let me write a one here just so that we see where that comes, what I'm about to write comes from. Okay. We are basically going to turn this on when t equals one. So that's going to shift us in the t variable and we turn it on when t equals one. Okay, so hopefully you recognize that this is going to lead to this kind of product between a switch. So this switches this piece on at t equals one and this translation in t. Given that this is the solution to our original differential equation, let's see if it matches up to the behavior that I described. This piece is zero when t is less than one, because again, the switch turns it on when time is one. So it's zero, which means that we start off with exponential decay. In fact, if you just zeroed out that right-hand side, you could solve it with just kind of calc, calc one techniques. So this is our original exponential decay. When t equals one, we strike it. So something happens, and this is that thing that happens, right, when time is one, but you know, after t, t is uh, one, this is just one. So this piece right here, this coefficient that looks kind of intimidating at first glance, this is just going to be the number one for values of time larger than one. So we're going to add to this a piece that kind of emerged from that strike we gave it, but this is also still just exponential decay. So we're going to add these two terms together, but ultimately the end result as time goes to infinity for the solution to this differential equation is exponential decay. We're just going to have a little action happen right when t equals one. All right, if you'd like to see a graphic of this, let me step aside and put up a little movie showing how this decay is going to be affected when time equals one, and then it will resume its decay. Okay, now we're ready to do this second order example. Y double prime plus 4Y prime plus 13Y equals the drop delta centered at T equals 5. And we'll have an initial position and initial velocity of 1. Once again, let's talk through what we expect to see. Uh, you can work out, let's see, 4 squared minus 4 times 13. That's going to be negative. So this is going to be an underdamped harmonic oscillator on the left, the natural motion. So between zero and five, if this was a spring mass system, we would see it oscillate back and forth with decreasing amplitude because it's underdamped. But when t equals five, we strike it with a hammer. So when t equals five, something is gonna happen. We might see some sort of jolt, like you know, shift in, in position, just like we had in the previous example. But then the moment is passed. So we hit it with a hammer at t equals five, it's gonna react. But then that natural tendency to decay with decreasing amplitudes and oscillate is going to resume. So that's what we think our solution should, should represent. Okay, this is just a bigger equation, more going on. Let me carefully take the Laplace transform of both sides. If you'd like to, at any point, you can pause and try to work ahead, um, but let's just go, go right into it. Okay, so taking the Laplace transform of the left-hand side, I think I'll do this piece by piece. The Laplace transform of y double prime Actually, let me just write what I'm doing. Okay, I'm going to take the Laplace transform of the left-hand side and set it equal to the Laplace transform of the right-hand side. Okay, later when I'm out of space, I'll regret writing that, but it's a nice first step. Okay, the Laplace transform of y prime prime is going to be s squared times the Laplace transform of y minus s times the initial position minus initial velocity. So that's minus s times one minus one, okay? Maybe I shouldn't pick one for both, but that's not where the question is interesting. And then we have plus four s times the Laplace transform of y minus four times the initial position, so minus four, and then plus 13 times the Laplace transform of y. And then on the right, it's just e to the negative five s. Direct delta seems intimidating at first, but it's actually pretty nice to work with, in my opinion. So it has a nice, simple Laplace transform. Let's kind of clean that up so it looks like an S. Okay, let's gather our Laplace transforms of Y on the left. You expect, when you do so, to get S squared plus 4S plus 13 times the Laplace transform of our position function that we're trying to find. Let's see if that square up is 4s plus 13. Yep. On the right, we are going to move everything else over. So we will have s 
plus 5 plus the exponential e to the negative 5s. Oh, my 5 and s are, I should be careful here. 5s. We need to isolate the Laplace transform of y, but I think before we do so, before we do so, we should look at that quadratic in more depth. You can take a moment to try to factor it into the product of two first order expressions, but it's not going to factor. In fact, we know that this is a underdamped harmonic oscillator, so we expect to see sine and cosine behavior. So that quadratic is going to lead us to that, and you can get to there by completing the square. This is s plus 2 squared. So that gives you s squared plus 4s plus 4. To get to 13, I need to add 9. So that's the quadratic, which means, let me write one more thing and then maybe step away, clear the board so that we can finish the problem. The Laplace transform of y is s divided by s plus 2 squared plus 9. Um, yeah, let me write that first. I'll explain my hesitation in a moment. Okay. And then plus 5 divided by the same denominator. We recognize omega here is going to be 3 because 3 squared is 9. And then plus, using the process that we just went through where we recognized a shift in t or translation in t, let me leave this exponential function out front. It's going to be the same thing. Something is going to get turned on when we hit our oscillator with a hammer, and that's going to cause us to pick up a heavy side function. Okay, so this, let's leave it out front and just write it here as 1 over s plus 2 squared plus 9. Okay, let me do some editing before we try to invert, because this could be perhaps better written. Think over what s plus 2 here is. It's a translation in s, right? So if it was just plain old sines and cosines, the denominator would look like s squared plus 9. But that's not what we have. We have s plus 2, which means that we've translated by two units um, in s. OK, you can check your chart, or maybe you've already come to the right conclusion. But what I would rather have in this numerator is not s. I would rather have s plus 2. I would like for it to match this. If I didn't have this expression here, I could add 2 and then subtract 2. But since I already have five units here, let me just slide two of those units here. So we'll, we'll change that to s plus 2, and we'll make this 3. OK, so I just borrowed two units, and the overall result is still the same. That's one good thing. In fact, it's really good because 3 squared is 9. That's going to invert really nicely. Speaking of 3 squared is 9, here I would actually rather see 3. I would like for this to be omega with this being omega squared. So let me take this 1 and turn it into a 3, which isn't too big of a change. That just means I need to pick up a constant of 1 third. All right, I think with these adjustments, we're actually ready to invert the whole thing. Don't know if I have enough room to squeeze it in down here. So when I come back in a moment, what I will have done is erase this line that I anticipated would take up too much space. So I think I'll just keep this and erase everything above it, and we will invert and I'll write it above. Okay, so take a moment to, if you, if you can do this by memory, that's great. If you have the chart, you can kind of back out term by term what each of these should invert to, that's fine as well. And when I come back in a moment, we will see if the position function that we work out matches the behavior that we anticipate. All right, let's see if we can invert this term by term. With this Laplace transform, we can say that our position function y of t should be the sum of these three pieces inverted. OK, so first, looking at these, you want to recognize that they are sine and cosine, which is which. The one that has the frequency variable in the, in the numerator, that's cosine. This one that has omega in the numerator, that's sine. So, OK, cosine, sine. That starts the process of what? Omega here is 3. I keep saying that, but maybe I should write it down. 
this tells us that um, since omega squared is nine, omega is three. You can read that. I'm sorry, it's kind of faint. Okay, so this is going to be like a cosine of three t term, a sine of three t term, except this translation in s gives us an exponential term out front. Okay, so this is going to be because of this uh, translation by two units in s, we pick up e to the negative two t. And then this, so that, that takes care of this s plus two, but also this s plus two. And then we've done this shift in s, so now we're just looking at standard cosine three t. Partnering up right away with that is going to be e to the negative two t sine of three t. Oh gosh, I'm gonna be out of room. So let me jump down here. Let me go ahead and write the one third. Okay, it's not that bad, it's really not. Notice that this whole piece looks exactly like this piece. So we're dealing with a sine term. And then it's like we're turning it on when five seconds have gone by. Okay, so here's how I'm going to write this slowly so that I can keep everything balanced because we have translation in S and we also have a time delay. So it's gonna be a translation in T. So shift in S and this causes a shift in T. I'm going to write the unshifted first and then do the shifting. I think that what I just said will make more sense when I do it. So if I just inverted this, it would be exactly what we just wrote down. So I'm gonna leave a lot of space because I've got to add some shifting, but let me start off by writing e to the negative two t with space, sine of three of, okay, let's write it carefully, three t, and I'm just gonna leave it, okay. So now I need to take this time and delay it by five seconds. So that's going to cause me to take this time, delay it by five seconds, this time, delay it by five seconds, and then we're going to turn this on at five seconds. That means put this switch function in. Okay, let's just double check because there's a lot going on here. I have my I have the solution down here that I worked out before starting this video. Yeah, we're good. All right, so if you worked this out on your own, hopefully you got exactly this or something very close and you've realized where you might have gone a little bit astray. Let's see, does this match the behavior that we anticipated? Well, this heavy side function is zero between zero and five seconds. So if we imagine the start for this harmonic oscillator, just get rid of this whole term, it's zero. We have oscillation with decaying amplitude. That's exactly what we anticipated because we had an underdamped harmonic oscillator. So it's going to oscillate back and forth toward zero. The amplitudes get smaller and smaller. Then something happens at five seconds because we're hitting it with a hammer. This flips on this when t equals five. So don't forget, when t is greater than five, this just turns into one. Don't like be too overwhelmed by this expression. It's just one after t equals five. So when t equals five, we pick up this extra term. So it's like we're causing the behavior to change right at t equals five. So something is going to happen when we when I show you the graph of this function in a moment, you'll see an action basically when t equals five, the harmonic oscillator will react to the the impulse. Oh, sorry, losing the ability to talk. The harmonic imp, uh, oscillator will react to the impulse that we're going to apply when t equals five. But then after we strike it, we're done striking it, so it's going to resume its natural inclination, which is to oscillate to zero with decaying. Amplitude. Okay, luckily this is the last example. So here's the oscillation, here's the decay, and this is just saying this is something that we pick up when t equals five. Okay, so hopefully dissecting this and comparing it to what we would expect if we just know that we have an underdamped harmonic oscillator, which is going to get struck right at t equals five, hopefully that helps you understand why this solution should be in this form. And also, hopefully, talking through this analysis together helps you anticipate in general when you're solving these kinds of equations, the final solution should make sense to you. So there's kind of the quantitative aspect of solving these problems, but there's also the deeper understanding. What are we modeling? What do we expect to see from our position function when we're done? At the end, we would like to be able to connect the two together. All right, thank you for your attention.